Dearly Father, Lord, we want to thank you so much for your blessings. Lord, at this moment, we want to be set free, Lord, from all of our worries and concerns that this world has placed on us. May we be able to focus on your word and on what you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to welcome our brothers and sisters in the Cooper and the Paris Church. I want to welcome you all as well. It's good to see your smiling faces. If I were, if I sold my house and my car, had a big garage sale, and gave all my money to the church, would that get me into heaven? I asked the children in my Sunday school class. No, the children all answered. If I cleaned the church every day and mowed the yard and kept everything neat and tidy, would that get me into heaven? Again, the answer was no from the children. Well, then, if I was kind to animals and gave candy to all the children and loved my wife, would that get me into heaven? I asked them again. Once more, the answer was no. Well, I continued thinking they were a good bit more theologically sophisticated than I had given them credit for. Then how can I get into heaven? A five-year-old boy shouted, you got to be dead. <laughs> this is just an illustration, but I think it illustrates very well what um, the misconception that we have of salvation, the misconception that we have of, of heaven. If you want to turn your, to your Bibles to the book of Matthew, in chapter 19, we find a question by an honest man. I was uh, telling the church members yesterday at our Vespers, which began at 6 and will be ending at 7.15 the next time that I'm here, and this is an invitation again for you all, um, that I would have loved to have Peter as a church member. You see, because the reason I love Peter is because there was no lie in Peter. Peter was an open book. You knew what he was thinking. The people that worry me are the ones that don't tell you what they're thinking, but then go behind your back and tell them what they think about the pastor. Those are the people that concern me. Peter was an open book. I'd much rather have a church man tell me, hey, pastor, I don't think this is a good idea for these reasons, and we can talk about it. That's, that's what a good Christian does. But Peter, after, the, after Jesus speaks with the rich young ruler in chapter 19, verse uh, 27, we find where Jesus tells the rich young ruler, go and sell everything and then follow me. And then Jesus says it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel is to enter the king through the eye of a needle. And then Peter says in verse 27, see, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Peter asks a good question. He's asking Jesus, look, this guy had so much more than we have. And he didn't leave it, but we did. We left everything that we have, and we follow you wherever you go, Jesus. So what is coming to us? Jesus asked a good question. It's a question that many of us, without speaking it out loud, we think it to ourselves as well. Lord, I have done these things. Lord, I have followed your rules here. I am doing all of these things here. So what shall be my reward? We have a sense of entitlement. And we bring that sense of entitlement to Jesus many times. Here in verse, chapter 20, verse 1, it says, For the kingdom of heaven, this is the answer that Jesus gives to Peter and to the rest of the disciples who were thinking what Peter was saying out loud. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Again he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. In about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard and whatever is right you will receive. How many of you have ever seen the movie The Cinderella Man with Russell Crowe? Only Anna and I. <laughs> that movie, The Cinderella Man, is about a, essentially a washed-out boxer. 
who he had a good streak when he was young, but then gets to a point where something is wrong with his wrist and he can't box anymore. And he's going through the, through the Great Depression with his family and the struggles that a man at that, in that uh, time of history had, where he couldn't find a job, he couldn't provide for his family. He's, he's having difficulties. And the scene that is shown that portrays the, the, the time of the age was all of these men lined up outside of a warehouse by the gate in the, the, the boss comes out and he's looking for workers and all of them are almost trampling on each other to try to get a job because there were no jobs. So only a very select few were hired. He had his hand bandaged up in a cast but he painted it black so this way the boss couldn't see that he had a glove that his arm was broken. He was willing to put away that pain so that he could provide for his family. So here, this is what is being portrayed. There's a, a rich man who has a vineyard and it's time for the harvest. So he goes to the place to find workers, a marketplace. There is a place in, in uh, South Texas, uh, right along um, Hidalgo, which is just the other side of uh, Reynosa here in the U.S. And this actually happened. It's crazy. We'd see a bunch of group of guys out there. I was like, what, what are they doing? And then one of my friends like, oh, those are the guys that are looking for works. Oof, looking for works. Those are the guys that are looking for work. So whenever somebody was out there and was like, hey, I need a painter. Oh, I have experience. No, they don't have to have experience. They're like, how hard can it be to put paint in the wall? But they're saying they have experience with this so they could get a job. This was actually happening down there, and it was pretty funny. It reminded me of this. So the rich landowner goes to find workers in the marketplace. And if you needed to pay your rent, if you needed to put food on the table, if little Johnny was sick, what time would you show up to work? As early as you possibly could. So it says that he went out uh, early in the morning when he found a group of guys. I named them Jose, Pancho, and Pepe. <laughs> so when he found these guys, he says, you know what, guys, I'll pay you a denarius if you go and work in my vineyard. So these guys were excited. They went and they went off to work they went. This is a little bit later, three hours later, he comes right back to the same place and says, what, you guys looking for a job? Yeah, we're looking for a job. Okay, well, you guys come too. I'll pay you whatever is fair. And does it again at the lunch hour. Hey, guys, you guys are looking for work? Yeah, we're looking for work. We can't get, okay, go to my vineyard and, and get to work, and I'll pay you whatever is fair. Goes again for a third time around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Says, you guys, you guys looking for work? Yeah, we're looking for work. All right, you guys go to my vineyard. You guys don't know where it's at. I'll pay you whatever is fair. And then goes again at the 11th hour at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, one hour left to work. And he says to the guys, what are you guys doing here? Well, nobody's hired us. I don't know if they showed up late. I don't know if there were so many guys out there that maybe he didn't see them. He says, what are you guys still doing here? Well, nobody has hired us. Well, guys, go to my vineyard. I'll pay you whatever is fair. So they go, and they start working, and they're getting all the grapes pulled from the vineyard. Verse 8 says, when, So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired at about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. These are the guys that showed up at five o'clock in the afternoon to work. Where am I? But when the first came, they were supposed they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have, showed, have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the heat of the day. Was that a fair comment? Let me ask you guys a question. If you show up to work at 6 o'clock in, in the morning, and you work a 12-hour shift till 12 hour shift till 6 in the evening, and all of a sudden the guys who showed up at 5 o'clock in the afternoon get the same amount of pay that you received, and you have been there for 12 hours, would you be upset? Yeah. yeah. They show up at 5 the next day. They show up at 5, yeah, there you go. It's a good point, or I'll show up at 5 the next day. <laughs> they, had a, they had a logical, a, a good reason to complain, and I think it's interesting that Jesus did things a little bit backwards. Usually, who do you begin to pay first? 
the guys who showed up first to work. But Jesus did this in order to show to Peter what's going on. Jesus did this to show to us who feel entitled what's going on. He made it a point that the last guys who showed up, I'm going to pay them the same amount that I paid the first guys. Now, did he tell the guys who he went and called the second, the third, the fourth time how much he would pay them? No, what does he tell them? I'm going to pay you what? What is fair. It was only the first guys who told him, who he told, I'll pay you a denarius. Did those guys go to work? Did they agree on a denarius? Yes. Did they agree for more? Did they agree for less? They said, we will work 12 hours for one denarius. The other guys were never told how much they were going to get paid. They were just told, you will get paid what is fair. Who decides that? If there is a place, one place where entitlement should, not, should be anathema or a curse or something that should be cast out, something that is disgusting, it is a local church. Remember the reason Jesus came to earth. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life in ransom for many. And how are we followers of Christ who live to, to live? We are to make our own attitude that of Jesus Christ. Servanthood should dominate the lives of church members. Putting others first should be our first priority. Entitlement has no place in our churches. How do we know when entitlement becomes pervasive in our churches? We can be sure it's present when we hear comments similar to these. I have been a member of this church for 20 years, so I deserve things my way. Someone was sitting in the pew where my family sits. I tithe to this church, so you work for me. If I don't get my way, I'll withhold my money from the church. Some people will be in trouble if they mess with the worship the way I like it. Well, I just, I'll just visit another church until things change back to the, things that, the way they were. Why didn't you visit me? That's what we pay you to do. I couldn't continue. Indeed, you could add to the quote as well. But my point I believe is clear. There's no place in church for self-serving attitude. To the contrary, we are to give cheerfully and serve others joyfully. How many of us have ever had that attitude of entitlement? Let's be honest. Every single person, if you're a sinner, you have had the attitude of entitlement. Well, wait a second. I have worked harder. I have been a member here longer. How come that guy's an elder? Look at him. He dresses funny. How come she's a Sabbath school teacher? She usually doesn't even come prepared. How come this? How come that? And you begin to look at everyone else. That's what these guys did. Wait a second, wait a second. Those guys showed up only with one hour to, left to work. Why are you paying them the same amount that you're paying me? We begin to have this sense of entitlement and it's a negative thing and it is something that shouldn't exist in the life of a Christian. Did Jesus ever feel entitled? No. What happened when it was at the Last Supper and all the disciples are sitting around and waiting to celebrate the Passover? What did Jesus do? Hey, Peter, you know what? You're the guy that speaks the most. You're the loudmouth. You're obnoxious. You get on everybody's nerves. You're going to wash everybody's feet. Especially mine because I'm about to die for you. Did Jesus have a sense of entitlement? No. What did Jesus do? He immediately grabbed a robe and put it around his waist and started washing his disciples' feet. Jesus never had a sense of entitlement. So here, Peter, he, when this parable, Jesus is speaking to Peter and to those who are thinking the same thing that Peter is thinking because just because Peter thought to himself or spoke out loud, hey, Jesus, wait a second, we have left everything to follow you. What, what's, coming for, what's coming to us? There was others who were thinking the same thing. I'm sure Matthew was thinking the same thing. I'm sure that John was thinking the same thing. I'm sure James was thinking the same thing. Peter was just a vocal piece for the rest of the disciples, for everyone else who is a sinner, for all of us here who are present, who at times feel entitled in church, who at times feel entitled with God. Lord, I've been tithing my whole entire life. I give a great love offering. Why aren't you blessing me, Lord? Why do I still ride around in my broken down Mercedes Benz? <laughs> That's not fair, Lord. That guy, he just started as a pastor, and yet he gets to be the pastor of the big church hear a lot of that in the pastor's meetings, and I've had that attitude as well. 
A sense of entitlement is a dangerous thing. It is something that should not exist in the life of a Christian. So what is this parable about? Is this parable about entitlement? Is this parable about a rich man who was so rich that he just all of a sudden just kept hiring guys? Should we learn the lesson like Earl said, next time just show up at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and get the same pay as everyone else? Is that what this parable is about? That's probably what I do. Is that what this parable is about? Is it about a generous landowner? Is it about a bunch of guys who caught mercy all of a sudden? Is it about a bunch of guys who were upset? The answer is in verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like. What is the kingdom of heaven like? You know, it's interesting that the Pharisees had all of a sudden corrupted the system of salvation. If you work hard enough, Ezekiel, if you do this enough, Gene, Earl, if you build enough of these things, then you will inherit eternal life. If you can keep your kids in church, if you can make them pathfinders and master guides, if you can put out kids who are preachers, then you will inherit eternal life. If you give your tithe even on herbs, like the Pharisees were teaching, then you will inherit eternal life if you do enough of. This is what the Pharisees, this is what the disciples were eventually believing. If I do enough of this, if since I have followed you, then I will receive this. In this world, it makes sense. If I work hard enough, if I, um, you know, what is it, dot my I's and... Yes, you all know what I'm saying. Then I will receive this. If I work overtime, if I have two jobs, then I will receive this. I will earn this. I can have a newer car. I can have a better house. In this world, it does make sense. Work does pay off, but not with the plan of salvation. Because if we were to have the rest of eternity and work 24-7 for the rest of eternity, we could never earn salvation. It is only through the merits of Jesus Christ, only through the merits of someone else doing the job, that we are saved. Salvation isn't for us to give. Salvation isn't for us to, to dictate, well, you have to do these things, guys. We're going to write out the rules for God. If you do enough of this, if you follow this, if you keep the Sabbath, if you do all of these things, yeah, I guess you can say then, then you'll be saved. What's going to happen to those guys who say, Lord, we preached in your name, we cast out demons in your name. What does Jesus tell them? Depart from me, for I never what? I never saw your works. I didn't know who you were, is what Jesus said. Salvation isn't about works. Salvation is about who you know, and it has to be Jesus Christ. And by no, I don't mean, yes, I know Jesus, I'm going to wear a little cross, I'm going to have a tattoo that says I love Jesus. By, by knowing means that you have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. But you know Jesus, you wrestle with your issues, you give your life to Him daily, you walk after Him daily. That is what the knowledge of Jesus Christ means. Salvation isn't for us to dictate. Here the guys were all upset, telling, <laughs> they're upset. Think about this. They don't have a job, and yet they get upset at the guy who hired them. Before that day, they didn't have any money. But they're telling the guy, wait a second, you paid them this much? We deserve more. They're telling the guy who's paying, pay me more. They have a sense of entitlement. He could do whatever he wanted to do with his money. If he wanted to pay them 50 denariuses, he could have done it. But it was out of the kindness of his heart. The man who dictated who got paid and how much they got paid was the landowner. In the same way, Jesus Christ is the only one that can determine who is saved and who isn't saved. You know, my dad taught me something in, um, about work. I don't remember why he said it to me. Maybe I was upset because some other guy had an easier job than I did. I don't remember. And he said to me, he said, you know what? Don't worry about them. You work. Work as hard as you can. Don't worry about Joe or, or Tom or Bob. Don't worry about them. If they're honest, they're going to receive what they deserve. If they're dishonest, they're going to receive what they deserve. You worry about yourself. It's the same way with salvation. 
Stop worrying about what these people are doing wrong or what they're doing right or all of these things and worry about your own relationship with Jesus Christ. It is only Jesus who can determine who is saved and who isn't saved. It's up to Jesus who he decides to bless more and who, des who, decides, who he decides to give blessings in a different way. Imagine you are half a million dollars in debt. Someone comes to you and writes out a check for 500000 saying this is all for you to cancel your debt. You don't have to do anything but reach out and take it. And it's yours. So you take the money and pay your debt. You are now debt free and totally in the clear. What do you have to boast about? Can you go around bragging about what you had the power, the skill, and the brains to reach out and take the check? Can you talk about what a favor you did for the benefactor, taking all the troublesome money off of his hands? Does that make any sense? Of course not. You received grace, nothing more, nothing less. You were impoverished. You received riches from, one, from another person. The fact that you are now debt-free is 100% due to your benefactor, 0% due to you. Who then deserves a praise and glory for your salvation? Clearly not you. You have received riches from the resources of God. His grace made it all possible. This parable is to teach Peter about grace. This parable is to teach Peter that salvation is up to God to give, not to Peter. This parable is about to teach is to teach Peter, stop worrying about someone else. Stop trying to feel entitled, Peter. Because at the end of the day, how many of us deserve anything? No one. It is only through Jesus Christ that we have anything. We should praise Him for everything and anything that we receive, whether good or bad. This parable is to tell Peter, stop feeling entitled. Come and follow me. This parable is, about, is to teach us that God's mercy is great. Remember the thief on the cross? How many good deeds did he ever do? You know, it's interesting, the Desire of Ages says that this man had heard Jesus preach and had heard the teachings of Jesus. And when he was hearing Jesus, he felt life come into his soul. And he wanted to change his life. He was already on the wrong track. He was already a thief. He was already a crook. And he wanted to change his life. So he's coming up to Jesus and all of a sudden, one of the just men, one of the Leaders in the church stops him and says, are you kidding me? You think this guy's, you think Jesus is going to want to talk to you? Look at your life. You're a crook. Come on, get real. So it says that this man, this crook, threw himself even deeper into sin. Threw himself deeper into sin. Because one of these righteous men told him that he wasn't good enough. You've squandered your life. You're going to show up at the 11th hour to work? Are you kidding me? You think, you think you're going to get a Daenerys? You think you're going to inherit salvation? And it wasn't until the 11th hour when Jesus is there hanging on the cross with him. Because if you read the accounts in the, in the, book, in the, in the Gospels, both crooks were hurling insults at Jesus, both of them. But all of a sudden, it's like the Holy Spirit touched that man and he remembered the words of Jesus, and he said, wait a second, this isn't, he's not a criminal, he doesn't deserve to die. And then he stops the other guy and says, don't you even fear God? We are receiving what we deserve, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he tells Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Are you kidding me? You're getting what you deserve. You're dying because you're a criminal. But God's math God's reason doesn't make sense to a sinner like us. And I praise God for that. Because none of us are worthy. Jesus tells them, I promise you today, you will be with me in heaven. At the very last hour, this man had done nothing right in his life. But Jesus decided to give him salvation. The same salvation that Peter will receive. The same salvation that John will receive. The same salvation that the martyrs will receive. Who laid down their life for something that was righteous, for something that was good. 
this man who did nothing wrong, this sinner, will receive the same salvation like any of us here if we give our life to Jesus Christ. And I praise the Lord for that. I praise the Lord for that because that means that God doesn't have a system of hierarchy with salvation. Well, you were okay, so we're going to put you on the bottom floor. You're going to listen to all the ruckus and the praising and the joy going on upstairs. Eh, you weren't so good. We're going to put you in the basement. You're still in heaven. But we're going to put you in the basement. You, oh, you have saved thousands of people. You gave everything away. You went to Afghanistan to preach, and you died at the stake. You will be in the luxury suite. That's not God's method of, method of salvation. For anybody who accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, whether it's at the last moment of their life or whether they accepted them when they were just a child, they will also inherit heaven. Now, am I trying to tell you, well, just go ahead and wait. Go ahead and party hard to the last day. That's not what I'm saying. Because the love that Jesus Christ can give us, the, the walk with Christ, if we accept Him at an early age, if we accept Him when we're young, if we accept Him now, well, we will be more glad. We will have more to reflect on and be happy that we have walked with Jesus for a lifetime than later being on our deathbed and saying, why didn't I do this sooner? What I want us to remember is this. Salvation isn't ours to earn. If there's anybody asleep, I want you to wake up. Salvation is not ours to earn. Salvation is God's to give if He chooses to give it. But the awesome thing is that John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that those who believe in Jesus Christ and who accept Him will have eternal life. It's that simple. Those who don't, they're getting what they receive. Don't feel entitled to salvation. Don't feel entitled in church saying, well, I deserve this or I deserve that. I deserve that position. Don't feel entitled. This parable is about the grace and the kindness of the landowner to show us what the kingdom of heaven is like. It is to show us the, the grace and the kindness of God the Father towards us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to first of all thank you because you don't have a system of hierarchy for salvation. Lord, I want to thank you because you're a gracious and a merciful God. Lord, if there's any of us here, Lord, who feel entitled, forgive us. Forgive us for saying, well, I deserve more, or why don't I get this, or help us, Lord, to focus on our own individual salvation with you, on that walk with you. Remove that selfishness from our hearts. And Lord, may we praise you. Because in this parable, you showed grace. You showed grace, Lord, to those even who showed up at the first hour. Because they could have been left unemployed, but you decided to hire them. Just like you decided to hire those who showed up at the 11th hour and the reward was the same. May we remember, Lord, that at the end of the day, our reward is the kingdom of heaven. May we praise your name for this forever. In your name I pray. Amen.